First the Pac-Man eats through a maze of dots <laughs> Then the Pac-Man heads for the corner spots Then he eats his fill <laughs> Of a power pill Only Atari makes the Pac-Man home video game, and you can only play it on an Atari video game system. Have you played Atari today? In the last video, we talked about setting up a development environment to enable us to write, compile, and execute some code using the DASM assembler and the Stella Atari emulator. We used a short piece of code, which simply turns the screen blue. And in this video, we'll examine that code to find out how it works. But before we do that, we'll have to talk about how the Atari 2600 executes its code and how it draws to the television screen. You see, back when the Atari 2600 came out, Televisions used a cathode ray tube, commonly known as a CRT. This would use a ray of negative particles fired from an electrode and directed onto a glass covered in phosphor. The negative particles would excite the phosphor, causing it to glow. Using magnetic fields, the ray can be deflected to land on any point on the glass. Done quickly, this forms the images we see on the screen. The first commercial CRT television was released in the 1930s, and while other technologies have all but replaced the CRT, they are still very much in use today. The CRT's electron beam starts drawing at the top left of the screen and draws a horizontal line across to the right. It then moves the ray back to the right and down one to draw another line. It repeats this action moving all the way down the screen to the bottom. It will then reset its position back to the starting point and begin drawing the next frame. On NTSC CRT screens used primarily in North America, this means the electron beam draws 525 lines per frame at about 30 frames per second. In many European countries, PAL screens are the standard, which uses 625 lines per frame at 25 frames per second. Another standard called CCAM is used in Russia, China, Pakistan, France, and a few other countries. It's similar to PAL, but the way that processes color makes it incompatible. There are versions of the Atari 2600 consoles for each of these standards. However, as we'll see shortly, the TIA chip in the CCAM version has a dramatically limited color palette. Due to the way the electron beam works on a CRT, there are several periods of time where it cannot draw on the screen. During these periods of time, you're free to do calculations in your game or set up the location of your game objects. Vertical sync is the time period it takes to signal the CRT to start a new frame. On NTSC CRTs, this lasts for three scan lines. Vertical blank is the time it takes to physically turn off the beam while it is being repositioned back to the start of the frame. This lasts for 37 scan lines. Horizontal blank is the time it takes to physically turn off the beam and reposition it to the start of the next scan line. This lasts for 28 clock cycles and happens on each of the 192 scan lines used for drawing the screen. Overscan is another period when the beam is turned off when it's not drawing on the screen. CRTs are not all made the same, so in some cases you may wish to draw a few more or a few less scan lines. For NTSC, the recommended number of scan lines to use for drawing the screen is 192, while PAL and CCAM recommended number is 228. For the most part, you can bend these numbers a little as long as the total scan lines per frame are equal to 262 for NTSC and 312 for PAL and CCAM. However, the farther you stray from the recommended values, the less compatible you will be with different brands and models of televisions. So, now we know how a television CRT works and the recommended timings of the sections of each frame. But how do we deal with this in our program? Let's take a look at some of the commands we'll be sending to the Atari's television interface adapter to handle drawing to the screen. The VCS.h file included with the DASM assembler includes predefined labels for common register addresses on the television interface adapter. The first is VSync or vertical sync. 
by assigning a value to this register, you're signaling the television to blank the beam and position it at the top of the screen to start a new frame. This signal must be present for at least two scan lines. You can then write zero to the V-Sync register to turn it off. Next is V-Blank, or Vertical Blank. By setting the V-Blank register to zero, you're telling the television to turn off the beam during its vertical sync. This takes 37 scan lines before the image will draw to the screen. W-Sync stands for Wait for Sync. The TIA keeps track of its horizontal position while it's drawing a scan line and will automatically move to the beginning of the next scan line when it reaches 76 machine cycles. Since it may be difficult, if not impossible, to determine exactly when this would occur in your code, you can write one to the VSync register and the TIA will halt execution of the 6507 processor until the start of the new scan line. The last register we'll talk about here is color background or color loom background. By setting a value to this register, the TIA will draw that color behind all objects. In this chart, we can see the Atari 2600 color palette for both NTSC and PAL, along with the hexadecimal values associated with each color. Notice that the NTSC has 16 available colors, while PAL is limited to 13. Both, however, have eight luminance values for each color. While the mapping between NTSC and PAL colors do not match up, with careful consideration, you could design your game to work with both with no changes. If you wanted to make use of the full color palettes in each format, you would need to distribute two versions of your game, as there is no way programmatically to determine which standard your Atari 2600 is using. This gets more difficult if you want to support CCAM, as there are only eight colors and no luminance values. You can still play NTSC or PAL games on a CCAM system, but the luminance values would be mapped to those eight colors. Now that we know how the registers on the television interface adapter work, it's time to talk about the registers on the 6507 processor and the various operations available to use for our logic and calculations. As we did before, for now we'll limit these only to the items that were used in our example program. Starting with the A or accumulator register and the X and Y index registers, each hold a single byte and most operations you will use work with the contents of these registers. The P or processor status register is set with certain flags based on the results of the last operation you executed. LDX and LDA both load a value into corresponding X or A register. STA will store the value currently stored in the A register into another location. INX will increase the value currently stored in the X register by one. CPX stands for compare X register, and depending on the value stored in the X register and what you are comparing it to, it will set the negative, zero, or carry flags of the P register. BNE stands for branch not equal, and will transfer execution to another location based on the zero flag of the P register. JMP stands for jump. This tells the processor to transfer program execution to the supplied address or label. There are a couple more registers on the 6507 and a lot more operations available in the instruction set. We'll leave those for a later video because right now we just want to focus on what exactly is our example code doing. So let's get into that now. In the first few lines, we're just telling the assembler what type of processor we want to run on and to include the VCS and macro files as part of your program. As mentioned previously, these files contain predefined labels to the TIA registers and a few helpful routines. Here we're defining a label named blue along with a value. In this case, we chose the hexadecimal value 9A. If we refer to our color palettes, we can see that 9A on the NTSC palette is a soft blue color. Luckily, that same value on the PAL palette is very similar. Had we chosen 5A, the color on an NTS television would be pink and a very different green on PAL televisions. Going back to our code, the next two lines are pseudo operations or assembler directives. They're not code that will be turned into processor instructions. SEG is defining the start of the code segment, which will be included in our binary ROM when compiled, and with org being with the address of the start of RAM. Here we define another label, but instead of assigning a value to it, it can be used as the destination of a jump point later on in the code. 
we'll go back to this reset label in a bit. The Atari 2600 starts up in an uninitialized state. So to start off with a clean slate, we need to zero out all of RAM in the TIA registers. First, we assign X and A to zero, define a label called clear to use as a loop point, and then store the value in A, which is zero, to the memory address stored in X. We then increase the value in X by one, then check if X is currently zero, and if not, transfer execution back to the clear label. Now you may be asking yourself, how does X go back to zero if we keep increasing the value by one? That's because the 8-bit registers wrap around from 128 to zero when you increment it past its maximum value. Since the increase X operation sets the processor status flags in the P register, we can use branch, if not equal, to monitor the zero flag in the P register. This is where we're going to set the color we want as our background. First, we load the value stored in the label named blue into the A registers. Then we store the value from the A register to the color background register on the TIA. Now we're going to start the first frame. So we create a label so we can jump back to it for each frame. The frame starts by first turning off V blank by loading zero into the A register and then storing A into the V blank register. Now we want to turn on VSync by loading two into the A register and then storing A into the VSync register. Since VSync requires three scan lines, we're simply initiating three WSYNCs as we covered earlier. Writing a value into WSYNC will cause the TIA to halt the 6507 processor until the beginning of the next scan line, at which point it will release the 6507 to continue executing starting at the next opcode. After three full scan lines, it's time to turn off VSYNC, which is done by loading zero into the A register and then storing it in the VSYNC register. After VSYNC, we have 37 scan lines of vertical blank. In normal circumstances, we would be coding our game logic during VSYNC, V blank, and horizontal blank periods. But since this is a basic demo and we're only setting the background color, we only need to generate the necessary timings. So once again, we're just gonna set up a loop calling VSYNC for 37 scan lines. We do this by loading zero into the X register. We'll use this as our loop counter and create a label called vertical blank as the beginning of our loop point. Then it's time to store a value into WSYNC, which will halt the processing until the start of the next scan line. We increase the X register by one and then compare the value in the X register with the value 37. If they are equal, then the zero flag on the P register will be set and the branch, if not equal, opcode will continue on to the next opcode. If the values are not equal, then execution will start again back at the vertical blank label to begin another loop. Now it's time for the television interface adapter to draw the screen, which will take 192 scan lines. Since we already set the color background register previously, we don't need to do anything else except wait for the whole 192 scan lines. Just as we did with the vertical blank period, we're just going to create a loop to generate 192 V-Syncs. After the screen is drawn, we'll turn V-Blank back on to stop the beam. This time we're loading a binary value which will set bit 6 and 1 of the V-Blank register. Bit 1 will cause the television interface adapter to display black, and bit 6 causes the TIA to latch the joystick buttons, which we'll go into more detail in a later video. Finally, we're in the overscan period, which lasts for 30 scan lines. And once again, since our code doesn't need to do anything, we're setting up a loop to initiate 30 WSYNCs, and then jump all the way back up near the top where we defined the start of frame label to begin the frame loop all over again. This will keep repeating itself indefinitely or until you turn off the machine. Here we're defining the locations of code that will handle a little housekeeping. The bottom three are interrupt vectors. You can think of interrupts as switches that can go on and the processor is constantly monitoring them. And an interrupt vector is a pointer to an area of code to execute when those switches are latched. NMI stands for non-maskable interrupt and typically occurs during a hardware error. IRQ stands for interrupt request and is used by hardware to tell the processor to stop and run its own code. Both of these cannot be triggered by hardware on an Atari 2600 6507 chip because the pins on the processor have been removed as a cost-saving measure. However, the Atari 7800 runs on a 6502, which does have the necessary pins and is backwards compatible with the Atari 2600 games. Reset is the only one you need 
and it must be at this location in the ROM file. You see, this is actually the very start of our program. When the 6507 starts up, it first executes the code located at this location. Here we have the reset vector pointing to the reset label, which we defined all the way near the beginning of your code. So the processor essentially jumps to this known address to find out where the start of our code begins. Well, that's pretty much everything that's going on in our code. Really, it's mostly nothing because we're just setting a background color and then wasting cycles until the vsync. We can't just take out those wasted cycles because it's actually essential to the television interface adapter's timings as we're tied to the refresh rate of the CRT television. The CRT is going to draw the screen on its own schedule and we just have to cram in our game logic in the folds. Now I have a slight modification to the code to better illustrate the scan lines. Here is the exact same code we looked at for the blue background, but I've added a single operation. Instead of defining the label blue, assigning it a color, and pushing that into the color background register, we're just going to push the current scan line index into that register. This will show all 128 NTSC colors on the screen at once, one per scan line. Of course, there will only be 104 for PAL and 8 for CCAM. We've looked at a lot of information on how the 6507 processor worked, a few of the capabilities of the television interface adapter, and we've gone through our sample code and made a slight modification. I hope you found this interesting and informative. If so, please like and subscribe to follow along. The code presented will always be available on our GitHub, which is linked below. What's your experience in programming? Have you done it before, recently started, or are you a professional? Have you programmed and assembled before or built a game? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and following along on our journey. Bye for now. My husband loves another man, Pac-Man. <laughs>